this track. Becky has just got, got a flat tire and uh, has just been texting me for help. So I've been uh, so they in the midst of uh, the new, uh, the new so I'm preaching now to Becky, so you can't really um, May I tell you this morning, I'm not going to speak about uh, mothers this morning, but uh, may I, I'm going to speak to you about the uh, the church at Ephesus. I want to um, talk to you a little bit about the church at Ephesus. Um, <clears throat> let me pray first. Let me pray. Lord, we come before you sensing your greatness, Lord, sensing that you want to do something so wonderful and real and powerful in each of our lives. And we pray that you will by your word and the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the letter to the Ephesians. Um, I don't know how far we'll get this morning. It'll be a beginning anyway. Um, and um, of course, the, when, I, when I start this kind of looking at a like the letter to the Ephesians, I want to step back and really look at the letters from, from, from a, a grand vista before you look at the detail. I love doing that in the Bible generally. Um, I remember asking people questions like, um, when, what, what's, the, what's the purpose of the new covenant? Why did Jesus come? Very simple questions like that. What, what did Jesus teach? It's very interesting when you ask these questions that a lot of people don't know. Why did Jesus come? Now, there's many answers, and I'm, I'm not saying that your answer will be wrong if it's not mine. <laughs> uh, there are many answers, and uh, uh, let me just give a few reasons why Jesus came. Why did Jesus come? The answer is, First of all, he came to show us what God is like. Uh, it's when we see Jesus that we know exactly what God is like. We know a little bit about what God is like from the, the Bible in, in terms of the, the, the prophets, the teaching, the history, the way God works. And we can see a lot about God from the created world around us. But Jesus came to show us exactly the heart of God, what the heart of God is like, what makes him tick, how he feels. One of my conclusions looking at Jesus is that God is nice. Um, you know, you sometimes people can be tempted to think, is God just stern, like some stern schoolmaster or something? No, he's... He's loving, and he's loving like a mother, as we already know. He's loving like a father. Wasn't Vicky's presentation wonderful? I'm biased. <laughs> but she's wonderful, isn't she? And um, she's a wonderful mother, too. Um, so that's the first reason Jesus came, is to show by his life, by his interaction, what God is like. And so when we read the Gospels, we're looking at God. And the best way God can express himself is by coming and living as one of us. That's why he came, because he, he wanted to speak in our language, to show, to put, if you like, a human face to God. God is not a man, the scripture says. But the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God came in Jesus Christ, to show exactly how God feels about us. And the, the answer is, when you look what God is like, the answer is very simply, God is amazing. He's not just nice, that's very far too weak, but he's amazing. And you could, you could always remember, when you look at the New Testament, and you read about Jesus, and you look at the cross, you know that God is love, sacrificial love, amazing love, 
And that's what we see in the person of Jesus. He came to touch broken lives and to bring healing to us. The second reason Jesus came was to prepare a sacrifice for sins. And he prepared himself that he would be able, as a mature man, at the age of 33, he would offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. That's probably the greatest mystery of the Bible. And it's confirmed throughout the whole sweep of the, of the, the Bible from beginning to end that Jesus Christ is the sacrifice that uh, takes away our sin and carries away our guilt and our shame and reconciles us to God. Jesus came to be the sacrifice. And that's why he died on the cross to take away our sin. The, um, the third reason um, why Jesus came is to be our example. So that when you know what a Christian should be, what, if you ask yourself, how should a Christian live? Ultimately, we know that he wants every Christian to become like Jesus. That's a huge statement. To love like he loves. And of course, when we begin, we are far from that ideal. But as we grow in his word and in his in it, knowing him, walking with him, we become like him. And that's his great work to change us and to make us like himself. The great goal of God is to have a great company of people who love like Jesus loves and that we in turn should be able to reveal God. The fourth reason, and we could go on to a hundred, I'm sure, but the fourth reason, and this is my last this morning at least, is um, that Jesus came to teach us. He came to teach us new ways to live. He didn't just come to show us, but he also came to teach us. And in the teaching of Jesus, there is a great lesson. There's a, 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 it, it goes uh, in many different aspects of our life. He came to teach us that we must be born again. We must be, um, if we're going to be like him, we must have a transforming experience of the love of God. We must receive him into ourselves, and that's his teaching. And that if we receive him, our life will change, and that then we can begin to express and walk with God um, and, uh, and love God and uh, love one another. And the teaching of Jesus is comprehensive, and we're not going to go through it all this morning, obviously. So that's the, that's the Gospels. And then you get the, um, the Acts of the Apostles shows us the first group of Christians in the book of Acts. And then you get the letters. The letters are, are most of them written by Paul, um, from uh, Romans, through to Philemon, 13 letters written by Paul, then some other letters. We're not sure who wrote Hebrews. We got Peter, wrote a couple of letters. John wrote some letters. The letters are to correct Christians, to keep Christians on the right path. Some of the letters are strong medicine for people who are going wrong. And uh, you can look at letters like to the Corinthians, they were going wrong, they were divided, they were arguing, and Paul says in his letters, this really isn't right. And uh, it's a denial, really, of what we should be as Christians. And so there are lots of letters of correction, we could list them, but let's just say that for the moment, letters to correct believers. When I think of that, I realize that believers need a lot of correction. I'm not talking about just one believer or one or five percent of us. All of us constantly need correction. Um, if, if you've ever uh, seen some of these space probes that go off uh, into outer space. Have you heard of this Voyager that's gone out of the solar system? It's are now passing on to another 
solar system. And uh, it's gone years, I don't know how many years is it? 25 years, is it 30 years? I can't remember. It's gone years, it's gone, still moving and it's still sending signals and it's gone beyond Pluto as far as I know. Voyager. And, um, but when they sent it off, if you imagine aiming something, if I were a, 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 a marksman and I could aim at that, something on that wall from here, I'd probably miss it. I'd have to really, why? Because certainly in this room, I'm, I'm sure it'd be easier, but if it was outside, there'd be wind movement, there'd be all kinds of things. And uh, I'd probably take about three or four shots to get a, in my case, probably a hundred to get a bullseye. But, you know, you, you, because, because that trajectory is a long way away, maybe a hundred feet. Just imagine shooting something a thousand feet, a mile. Now Voyager has gone, I don't know how far, hundreds of millions of miles. And the, that, that long journey, how do they keep it on course? The answer is by something they call course correction. We need correction. Our journey is long and we need to be, and what they have in these space rockets is little side rockets that keep on adjusting its direction. There's the goal and it's shot off and then it's veering off. So they, another little rocket blasts and it comes back on route and then again and back on route and, and on it's going and it's constant activity of correcting us. We need correction to keep us on track. And that's what many of the letters are doing. Ephesians is not really a letter of correction. I don't think there's anything wrong in the, the church at Ephesus when you read this letter. There's nothing wrong. It's probably like Epsom. Almost perfect. <laughs> We're practically perfect in every way. Isn't that right? Well, there we go. Um, but you see, ex if, if we look at the letter of e to the Ephesians, there was no correction of doctrine. There was no major correction of conduct, they weren't divided. The purpose of that letter was to exhort them to go on with God. And in one way, you could say there's a correction, the correction element to that, because if we are not rising up to go on with God, then we're not really going to fulfill the plan of God. So this exhortation to rise up and, exp and go on with God, that's really what the, the letter to the Ephesians is about. Why do I say that? It's because in many ways, the Ephesian believers were some of the greatest believers in the, in the New Testament. They were wonderful believers. It was a wonderful church. But that makes it all the more surprising that this wonderful church at Ephesus was exhorted to go for more. There's more. I'll just show you a couple of things in, in the... In, uh, at the moment, we won't look at them in detail, but if you look in chapter one of the Ephesians, he's gone through their history in the first part of the chapter. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that, we'll start looking at it today. Um, he looks at their history and he says in verse um, 12, We who first trusted in Christ, that's the first group of believers in the first years of Christ's ministry and of the, uh, we who first trusted in Christ. And then he says in verse 13, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, you believed in Christ. And then you were also sealed with the Holy Spirit. And then he says in verse um, uh, 15, I pray 
that the verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He says, I want you to receive an experience of the Holy Spirit uh, in revelation. Go to chapter 3, verse 14. He says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would grant you, verse 16, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you may, summing it up, may be able to know the greatness of the love of Christ. Just take this, if you think of the, who is the greatest Christian you've known in your life? Some of you will have a name, a person, a church, a period of time, a ministry, maybe something. Paul is writing to them and saying, I'm praying for you to know more. And he's saying, I want you to know more of Revelation. I want the spirit to work in you. And he also says in, in chapter three, I want you to know more of the love of God. So this is a letter of, if you like, some measure of correction by saying, you've got to keep going. You've really got to keep going. There is an ocean of discovery. There's a world to explore. There's the heart of God to, to be made known to you. And he's saying it. I love the way he say, he's saying it. He's not saying, I want you to study books. I'm sure he wanted them to study books. <laughs> Certainly the Bible. But he's, he's saying, I want you to receive the spirit the ministry of the holy spirit i want the holy spirit to touch you in your hearts that you would know the love of god not just from a book but by experience he's saying there is there are greater and greater depths for us to go to to discover the greatness of the person of god by the work of the holy spirit so that we will know God by experience. If I, if I were to um, go on and say, well, what more does he say? He basically say, I want you to know the very center and heart of the Godhead, his love, his ministry, his kindness, his touch, by experience. I want you to know this in your life. So, He's basically saying, I want you, I'm praying for you, that in your walk with God, you will have an experience of the love of God. Ask him for it. Pray him for it. Pray. Give to me those two prayers. Give to me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, we're going to go back into the book of Acts chapter 18 and look at the beginning of this church at Ephesus. And I want you to see as we, we uh, look through this beginning, that this is a pattern. That what you have is people who receive some knowledge and are then taken to further knowledge and further knowledge and further knowledge. And what you have is beginning in chapter 18 and going into chapter 19, it describes how the church was started. Then you get the letter when he's saying, and there's more, and there's more, and there's more. If I were to uh, say what, what is the greatest need of the church, it is, it, it is not a correction in terms of what's going wrong. It's an exhortation to go further in the reality of knowing the ministry of the Holy Spirit, ministering the love of God to us and opening us up to the supernatural dimension of God and his love. That's really the purpose 
of the Ephesian letter. He's got two great prayers in Ephesians. He said, I'm praying for you. You need to know more. And when I think of that, I think, Lord, if they needed to know more, I think I need to know vastly more. I am in such need of knowing more of the love of God. It's, it's a position, if you like, of becoming vulnerable, of, be, of realizing I know so little. Let's go to chapter 18 and see. This is really how the church started. Let's go to um, chapter 18 and verse. Um, this is how the church started. Um, uh, verse 19, Paul came to Ephesus. He came with two people, Priscilla and Aquila, and he left them in Ephesus. He, he left them there. He himself entered the synagogue in Ephesus before he left them there and reasoned with the Jews. The Jews asked him to stay a long longer time with them but he didn't consent. And um, I find it extraordinary that the Jews in the synagogue were saying, please stay with us. And he said, no, I find that astonishing. He took leave of them saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. He left Priscilla and Aquila there. Verse 24. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. He was from some kind of uh, Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge. Alexandria was a great center of learning. He'd come from there. He was an eloquent man, and he was, love this phrase, mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. When you read that phrase, this man was mighty in the scriptures, what does it speak to you? It speaks of a person who had soaked himself in the Bible. I think in these days of the early church, nearly all those early preachers and teachers were Jews. Why? Because they knew the Bible. They really knew the Bible. When you imagine a, a person like myself, when I came to Christ, I was 18. I had, I had hardly read a page of the Bible. But when a Jew was 18, he had spent his life reading it, being taught it, even memorizing whole passages. Jews were, were, were brought up in that. The, 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 the scriptures were part of the fabric of their thinking. But when I was 18, I hadn't read a single page. <laughs> Certainly not on my own. I didn't even have a Bible. I bought a Bible, and I began to read it at the age of 18. And this man, Apollos, brought up, no doubt, as a child, as a Jew. But at some point, he had been gripped with the power of the Scriptures and had begun to receive the Scripture as the power that would change his life, the doorway to another world. That's what the scripture is. The, the, the Bible is a book that opens up another world. When, uh, when you think about it, the, the Bible is God's greatest gift before Christ came, God's greatest gift to the world. If, I, if you think about the, the Jewish nation, it says in, in Romans, it says, what, what advantage then in being a Jew? And it says, oh, many advantages to being a Jew. Chiefly, chiefly, that unto them were committed the oracles of God. What's the oracles of God? 
the Bible. The chief advantage of being born a Jew was that you were going to be brought up with the scriptures and they would be part of your life. In fact, if you, if you, if you ever go to Israel, one of the things you see everywhere is little boxes with the scriptures on the hotel doors and on the houses, of, houses everywhere. They have these little scripture boxes and uh, the scriptures are everywhere. It's part of the fabric of their thinking and of their culture and their we celebrate Easter because it's a Christian festival, but of course the Jews were celebrating it as the Passover before. Mighty in the scriptures. If you think of receiving power into your soul to change you, the first packet of power is the scripture. And I'm so glad, I have no regrets over this, that from the time I became a Christian, I began to read the Bible. And I, I read it um, uh, slowly at first, then I read it, I got into it, the, Ho the Holy Spirit opened it to me, I couldn't stop reading it. I would pray it, I would meditate in the night seasons, I would wake up in the morning and turn to it and pray, it, and it's been my life. Over my whole Christian life, I've read the Bible once a year. So that's now getting to fit this exactly 50 times. But over that, that period of time, God has taken me into scriptures where I've read um, say the New Testament 10 times in a year for several years. So I've read, I, I've kept records because I, I, I read it systematically. I've read parts of the Bible hundreds of times. And I would say that that is, that is the, I'm so glad that that's something that was laid into my heart right from the beginning. Read the scriptures. I think one of my first mentors as a new Christian was a, a man, his name was John Jerems. He had a hardware store on the high street in our village. Sunday night, we used to go around when I was converted, we'd go around and we'd have Bible study in his, in his, in his house and he would hold the scripture and you could see he loved it. He loved the Bible. A man, eloquent, but mighty in the scriptures. If you want to explore God, explore the scriptures. Ask God, how can I read them? Read books on how to read the Bible. There's a book, there's a book written by a man named Gordon Fee. It is how to read the Bible for all its worth. And uh, you get these books, but the thing is, don't just have a casual relationship with the Bible, get into it. Uh, as I've said, this is a pattern in the whole if Ephesus church ex experience. This, these, these ways God was showing them, there's more. And if ever we are to get more, it's going to be in part, through the scriptures another part will be through the outpouring of the holy spirit but they will be joined they will be the complete whole if the holy spirit is going to reveal to me the love of god he will do it as i meditate in the scriptures when i when a farmer prays for rain um if there was a drought you would join him in praying for rain. Um, remember back in the days of Amoeba Farm in Zimbabwe, we prayed often for rain in the days of um, drought there. And I remember the, the, the rain map that they showed that the rainfall was highest over Amoeba Farm. That was the area in the whole country. We prayed for that place. But the farmer who prays for rain 
and doesn't sow seed in his ground is a fool. What good does rain do on a, on a field with no seed in it? And the seed is the scripture. And when we pray, Holy Spirit, move in my heart, I've got to give him something to move on. And the answer is he, the scriptures, mighty in the scriptures. Let's read on. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. What a wonderful phrase. He'd been taught in the way of the Lord. And he was fervent in spirit. He got excited about what he knew. He spoke and he taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. He only knew the first part of the Gospels. He hadn't really gone very, he hadn't been introduced to, to what had happened further down the line. It doesn't actually uh, explain at what point he knew up to, except he says he knew only the baptism of John. But he taught accurately the things of the Lord. So he must have taught repentance. He must have taught forgiveness through repentance. He must have taught the, the, the simple fact of knowing that if your sins are forgiven and you've repented, you can be sure that you will be received by God in heaven. You will escape the wrath to come. He only knew that. But when I think the little word only, the word only doesn't really uh, cut it here. To only know that your sins are forgiven. To only know that you'll go to heaven when you die. These are big things. And he knew that. I'm sure that his fervency and excitement was because he believed it and had experienced it. He was sure of it. He knew the love of God in its earliest stages that he could repent of his sin. He could speak and say, I, I renounce this way of life, this way. And I, he got baptized in, in water, no doubt, according to John's baptism. He committed his life to following the Lord as, as simply as that was. And that's all he knew. Well, I hope you know that too. I hope you know that too. I hope you have been introduced to the simple foundation of repent. Confess your sins. It says when the John the Baptist preached, he, he warned people of the wrath of God to come. He warned them of the danger of their sins. And he, he was very practical about it. He said... Let him that stole steal no more. He said, if you are, he said, if you're um, a soldier, don't, don't use your position to be violent to anybody. Uh, and he was, he was very practical. He said, John the Baptist's preaching was in, incredibly detailed in this respect. He was saying that way of conduct is wrong and you must forsake it. And they flocked to him. I think John the Baptist's ministry, this man knew a bit about it. I don't know if he'd heard him. But John Baptist was a man full of the Holy Spirit, it says. He was the greatest prophet in the whole Old Testament era, right up to the coming of Christ. The last forerunner before Christ, pointing the way to Christ. If I were to sum up the ministry of John the Baptist, John the Baptist, by the power of words alone, shook a nation. A bit like our John Wesley in this nation. When I think where John Baptist began his ministry, I'm amazed. Because it says he went into the deserts. If ever you think of starting a ministry, where would you think? Go to the high street. Go to a public place. Don't go to some distant woods don't go to the woods far away where there's nobody well, well why would you start a ministry there the answer is i've no doubt 
that when he got into the wilderness, he was there alone with God. He was hearing the voice of God. He was close to God. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And then in the wilderness, he might maybe met one person or maybe two people passing by. And as he met them, he would have shared with them and, and pleaded with them. And the power of the Holy Spirit would have convicted them of sin. And there in the wilderness, he would have led them in prayers of repentance, probably baptized them. Those two or three people would have gone back to their villages or their towns and said, you've got to hear this man. You've got to hear. And so the Bible says, that they came in multitudes into the wilderness to hear John the Baptist. And they came at last from Jerusalem, people asking him questions, bigwigs from the churches, that, from the synagogues and temple there in Jerusalem. They all came down because this man's ministry was speaking from another world. And he was speaking to them and shaking the whole nation. When I think of the power of John the Baptist, it was the power to convict a nation, to grip a nation and bring a nation back to God. I would say it's probably the, the greatest need of our nation today. Just riding here today in the car, passing people on their bikes, golfers on the golf course and uh, dog walkers, joggers, everything, all the activities, nobody's going, very few are going to church, very few. We need a turning back to God. This man knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly of this little that he knew. And you could almost draw a line under that and i would say that's where i began my christian life when i began when i was 18 and heard the gospel it was in a baptist church and um i remember my pastor his name was pastor love what a great name <laughs> his name was brian love i spoke to him recently um he got he's retired now quite old in uh, in cornwall but i spoke to him and uh but he preached with, and I would say he was rather like Apollos. He didn't know much beyond these few things. And I was baptized in those days and it was great. And I would say that just like that, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. My pastor spoke boldly in the schools came to visit my school one day, Sixth Form College. He spoke boldly in youth camps, youth, youth rallies. He spoke passionately in the Baptist church. You see, we're going to go on as we look through the Ephesian letter. We're going to finish now, don't worry. But the, the correction for the Ephesians was, don't just settle down and be, and be passive about what you know. There's more and there's a world out there to win. He began to speak boldly, passionately, fervent in spirit. And he wasn't baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's going to come later on in this chapter. You know, I, I sometimes meet people who are baptized with the Holy Spirit. They've had some experiences of the Holy Spirit. But they're not fervent. They don't speak passionately. And they don't speak with fervor. And I'm reminded of the, one of the words of, of um, uh, Paul to, to Timothy. Stir up the gift that is in you. You know, you might say, well, I don't know very much. You know a lot. Every one of us in this room is already, if we know this, the power of the scriptures, 
start there and stir up the gift that is in you. Stir up your simple knowledge of the forgiveness of sins. Stir up the, the things you know. What do you know? What is it that makes you a Christian? Because there's a world dying for that little knowledge. Time's gone, so we, we, we'll come back to the next verses next time. <laughs> Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. says in the letter to the Ephesians, the forgiveness of sins, redemption. He says there this wonderful phrase, simple phrase in Ephesians chapter um, uh, 1 verse 7. In, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Father, thank you for this foundation of everything, that those who repent, their sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. It's wonderful. And we believe it together this morning. We confess our faith in it. It may be the most simple, basic step of all, but we confess it. We will build on it. We will be fervent about it because it's wonderful that my sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen.